where the rivers are beaming and all the world's dreaming peace everlasting hate and love hate it enough to live by the ways of the world to be part of the picture whatever it's worth throw your arms round each other and love one another for it's only one life that we've got Happy Sunday. <laughs> One of my favorite days, I want you to know. I really just, I, it is. I just, I, I get up and I go, oh, good, I get to go to unity again. <laughs> well, I'm blessed to see all of you. I'm blessed to be here. And um, I, we've been having, uh, going on a real interesting journey over the last several weeks. And we've got a couple more weeks we're going to do this. And we're going to actually go into a little more, a little more depth into some of the things we've been talking about in terms of radical forgiveness, radical self-forgiveness. And um, uh, I came across a, I, I you know, always like to start off with a little story, something a little humor, something to lighten things up a little bit. And, and I came across this uh, reporter interviewing an old man on his 100th birthday. And he says, what are you most proud of? He asked the 100-year-old man. And the man said, well, I don't have an enemy in the world. And the reporter said, well, that's wonderful. That's, I mean, that's just very inspiring. What a beautiful thing to not have an enemy in the world. He says, old man said, yep, I've outlived every one of them. <laughs> I hope you outlive in more ways than one every perceived enemy. And that's kind of what we're working with, isn't it? We're trying to really move past and live beyond where we were because we know that there's a, 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 a shift that happens inside of us. And as we begin to shift, then we do. We do exactly that. We live beyond what we perceived as our, our enemies. There's also a story of a, about a, a student at Cambridge University who entered the classroom on exam day one day and asked the proctor of, uh, to bring him cakes and ale. And the proctor refused and just said, you know, it was astonished the young man would be so audacious to ask for such, such a thing. And, but the young man pointed out, he said, the student read from a 400-year-old law in Cambridge, um, which was written in Latin and, um, and still in, a, in effect, apparently. Uh, the passage read by the student said, gentlemen sitting for examination may request and require cakes and ale. And the proctor was forced to then comply. <laughs> and so uh, they figured Pepsi and hamburgers were judged to be a modern equivalent of cakes and ale. Um, and so they settled on that. And, um, and after all, the law was on the young man's side. And so three weeks later, uh, the student was summoned to the Office of, the Academ of Academic Affairs and was there to face disciplinary action. Um, and was assessed a fine of five pounds. And he was fined not for demanding cakes and ale in the classroom, but he apparently blatantly disregarded another obscure Cambridge law, which said that you were required to wear your sword during examinations. <laughs> and blatantly disregarded it. Some of the things and some of the laws that we work with seem rather archaic at times, and some of the ways we act seem rather archaic, and some of the actions that we have and the belief systems that we hold are actually pretty archaic at times, and yet we still hold to them. We hold to them in ways that we oftentimes aren't aware that we're holding to them, don't we? And that's one of the things that happens oftentimes with our own judgments that we have about ourselves. Sometimes they're just simply archaic and they just really don't serve anymore, and they really, there's no place for them anymore. And so that's part of our work is to begin to shift and to move into a different awareness, a different energy, a different consciousness, a different way of looking and seeing the world and seeing ourselves. There's a wonderful Peanuts cartoon, and Lucy goes up to Charlie Brown and with a paper and pen and says, here, sign this. It absolves me from all blame. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> then he goes to Schroeder and says, here, sign this. It absolves me of all blame. And finally he comes to Linus and he says, she says, here, sign this. It absolves me of all blame. And he signs it. And she walks away and Linus says, gee, that must be a nice document to have. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> well, you know, the reality is that there's something that all of us have the ability to really have that document in our own sense, in our own way. Um, there was, um, and I want to share with you another story. And this one actually is a story, it's called a story about generosity. And I, and I, I like it, but it, it actually says some things about what we're talking about here in our lessons about forgiveness as well and, and self-forgiveness. Uh, years ago, Canon, on Candid Camera, you guys remember Candid Camera? Some of you do, some of you. Some, if you've never seen it before, you get a chance to look for some reruns of Candid Camera. It just is absolutely amazing. Anyway, so they did an experiment about generosity on one, one show, and the children were placed by themselves in a room with a plate of cookies. And on the plate were at least two cookies, and there may have been a few more, but one of the cookies was very large. And the adult left the room, and the kids were allowed to take a cookie. But, you know, they all took the largest cookie, yes. every one of them. And so one of them, they were interviewing the kids, you know, and said, well, now, one boy was challenged to ask, and asked, why, why did you take the largest cookie? And uh, Alan Funt was, of course, the host of the show. You guys remember Alan Funt. He says, uh, he says all you left me to eat was the little cookie. I would have eaten the little cookie and given you the biggest one. And without a blink, the boy said, then you got the one you wanted. <laughs> I think I could end my lesson right there. <laughs> it's important for us to recognize that oftentimes we are, you know, it's, it's a recognition that we are really getting what we're asking for oftentimes, whether we do it on a conscious level or an unconscious level. We are participating in creating, promoting, or allowing our experiences in life from a spiritual perspective for the purpose of giving us a treat. And giving us a treat that's really um, there for us to learn from and to grow from. And so today I want to invite you to... Uh, I want to invite you to do, go through some, some work with me today. We've been doing some, I've been talking about these principles and these ideas of radical forgiveness. And so I want us to do a little exercise and, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the actual steps and process of, 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 of radical forgiveness and go into a little bit more depth on them. And so I invite you to get a piece of paper and a pen. If you, you can use your bulletins. If you've got a bulletin, that'd be great. And a pencil or pen. If you don't have a pencil or pen, please, if you have one, pull it out. If you don't, raise your hand. We've got some, a few over here we can help you with. And as you're getting the things ready here, um, this is actually simply a self-awareness tool. It's a way of kind of giving us an, a, an insight into our way of looking and seeing things. And so there really are no right or wrong answers. It's really a way of simply identifying a way that how we are perhaps seeing. And so what I'm going to invite you to do is <clears throat> write down one, two, three, four, five, six down, down your piece of paper somewhere. You're not going to need to do a lot of writing on this exercise, so don't be concerned about it. It's just actually a, a scoring. So what I'm going to you to do is uh, I'm going to read to you six paradigms and, that he presents. And as I finish reading each paradigm, what I invite you to do is put a score beside the paradigm based upon how true you feel that is for you or how true it is for how you tend to, and notice the word tend, how you tend to see or look at things, how you tend to look, see or look at the world, at life, at yourself. And, and so the scale is basically a zero to 10 scale. So zero means, no, I don't see that at all. 
And 10 means, yeah, that feels really true. That feels, I tend to, I tend to see things that way. Doesn't mean you always see it that way, but you tend to sometimes. Does that make sense? And so it's, okay, so let me go ahead and read the first one. You guys ready for this? All right. I take a rather scientific, secular, rational view of life. I think that human beings are simply part of the evolutionary spiral and that like every other animal on the planet, we are born, we live, and then we die. Yes, there's a lot more to it, but that's more or less it in a nutshell. I'm not a strong believer in a deity, God, though I wouldn't go so far as to call myself an atheist. I'm not inclined to think there is reality beyond what I register with my five senses. If there is, I have no real idea what that might be like, and I'm certainly not in touch with it and wouldn't know how to talk about it. Until now, forgiveness to me has meant making a conscious decision to let bygones be bygones. So one of the things I, want to, I meant to say and I want to point out is he presents that these not necessarily as right or wrong ways of looking at things, but a way of looking at things. And there's a value in recognizing that. And so notice that for yourself and notice if there are times where you have this pr perspective and this, this insight, this uh, way of seeing things. All right, we ready for number two? My spirituality and worldview come directly from my religious beliefs. I tend to see the world as a continuous struggle between good and evil. I believe that evil, Satan, does exist, and it is my job to stay vigilant and defend against the ever-present danger of it coming into my life. God made this world, and he made me as well. He remains in heaven, but is always watching and judging me harshly for ha having committed the original sin. When I die, I hope he will judge me kindly, though, and I will go, that I will go to heaven. If I don't live a good life, I will go to hell. I believe in being kind to others, but I believe forgiveness is not ours to bestow. All we can do is ask God or Jesus to do it on our behalf. So in my opinion, forgiveness is prayer, and ultimately, should the prayer, the prayer be answered, it is pure grace. So on a scale of zero to 10, kind of ask yourself, and this is again a self-awareness tool, it's not really a, a right or wrong, just notice. It's a way of noticing. You guys ready for number three? I'm somewhat open to spiritual ideas and find them intellectually interesting, but I wouldn't necessarily call myself a, a very spiritual person. I'm sometimes open to the idea that we are here to learn certain lessons, and I do try to interpret life in this way, but I don't find it easy to practice. Even though I am quick to blame and see fault in others, I try to entertain the possibility that the person I am upset with is there to teach me something. I know I shouldn't try to figure out what the lesson is, but I am an intellectual person and love to know the how and why of things. I also understand at the intellectual level that others are providing an opportunity to learn and grow, but I find it hard to really integrate that belief into my being. I always struggle with that in real life. I understand at the intellectual level that true forgiveness comes when we realize that everything happens for a reason. But in everyday life, I find that difficult to put into practice. So go ahead and score that one for yourself. You may find that there's a mixture of some of these and that's okay also. Okay, let's go on to number four. I see life as a mystery, not so much to be understood and figured out, but to be experienced as fully as possible. I think the most spiritual people are the ones who exhibit the most humanness. I'm open to the idea that there is more than one reality. There is at least this physical reality that we inhabit bodily every day, but I'm also open to the idea that there's another reality that we cannot see, which we might call the spiritual reality. I don't think anyone really knows what that reality is, 
But when I open my eyes fully and feel into my gut, I sense enough evidence that such a reality exists. I am comfortable with that. I have my own way of connecting with that reality and expressing my spirituality. Organized religion, being a member of a like-minded groups, meditation, retreats, healing, prayer, chanting, and so on. And I'm happy with this. Forgiveness to me is done by extending compassion to others and seeing them as imperfect human beings just like me and everyone else. You guys ready to score that next one? And this is, he's calling these different paradigms. Paradigm five. I'm a spiritual being having a human experience. By that I mean I have chosen to come to earth in order to learn lessons and evolve spiritually. This is the school and life is the curriculum. What happens during my life are my individual lessons. I've come into the life experience with a desire to fully grasp what oneness is by, expressing, by experiencing the opposite of it, separation. I made agreements with other souls prior to my incarnation that they would do things not so much to me, though it will feel that way while I'm in a body, but for me. While I'm here, I also enroll others to give me opportunities to learn. They look like enemies, but I see them as my healing angels. That's how I see forgiveness, that everything that happens invariably occurs for a spiritual purpose, and that while I remain accountable for what I do in the human world, in purely spiritual terms, nothing wrong ever happens. And feel free to go ahead and rate that one. Again, this is how you tend to see things. And then number six. I'm totally into metaphysics, and I see myself as a very spiritual person. I see our life on this planet as being on the wheel of karma, reincarnating over and over, lifetime after lifetime, learning lessons, balancing energies, and evolving spiritually until one reaches completion. Com yes, completion. I'm in touch with the spiritual realm and receive guidance from that side of the, void, the veil. I have several spirit guides and I frequently talk with angels. I believe that we are human beings, are all part of the Godhead, our purpose for our lives being to assist God in expanding his, her consciousness and to eventually co-create heaven on earth. As far as forgiveness is concerned, I am certain in my own mind that everything is in perfect divine order and that there is nothing to forgive. Forgiveness, therefore, is moot. So these are actually six different ways of looking at and understanding things. And now that's not to say that these are the only paradigms that there are or that there aren't combinations of those. My sense is, and tell me if I'm wrong, that we probably felt really very, very connected with some and very much not connected with others. Wouldn't you agree? But it's just an awareness of where we tend to focus and operate in life. And so it's just a, a tool for having us to have some awareness about how we are operating and working with some of these, these thoughts and ideas. And so in working with this, I wanted to have us go into and discuss Colin Tipping's five stages for radical self-forgiveness. I was ready to talk about the, this a little more in depth. So the five stages are really, um, and, and you may want to write these down. They're, you know. Stage one is telling the story. Anybody ever had a story? <laughs> Part of the work of telling the story and the purpose of telling the story is to first of all recognize that we've got a story. Because we have a tendency not to recognize we have a story, we tend to believe that the story is the reality and that we're in the, the, the story and that we are in the reality. That makes sense? And so part of our work in telling the story is to recognize the story. 
the story that we're telling ourselves. Now, it may be is, is whether we are a victim or a perpetrator of a wrongdoing, we will always have a story about what happened. All of the pain and suffering will be contained in the story, so having that story heard, witnessed, and validated is the first step in clearing the space for forgiveness or self-forgiveness to occur. And so part the first step is to tell the story. So telling the story, the value of telling the story, again, is to acknowledge and recognize a story. That makes sense? So the second part of radical self-forgiveness, the second step, is to feel the feelings. Now, wait a minute. They're just feelings, right? We don't need those. <laughs> they get in the way, right? The reality is, feelings... <laughs> He says, every per perpetrator story has a bundle of emotions attached to it. Yes, guilt and shame will be the primary feelings, but anger, fear, regret, remorse, and a whole host of other similar emotions will be right up there with the guilt and the shame. And he goes on to say, you cannot get, excuse me, you cannot heal what you don't feel. You cannot heal what you don't feel. Now, he goes on to say, and I think this is really important, you don't have to feel in the same intensity or in the same way to the same extent that you did in the original experience. And that's an important awareness. In other words, you don't have to go back into all of that pain in order to recognize it and to feel it and to experience it. But in order to release it, he goes on to say that there is, with every... With every uh, emotion, there's a thought that goes with that. They're connected, they're bonded. They are, they're really very difficult to separate the thought and the feeling oftentimes. But in order to be released from the feeling, you have to be able to move into an experience of it on some level. And there has to be, uh, it goes on to say, the best way he says it, um, it must be engaged in some way. So you don't have to just drown yourself in it, but it is important not to suppress it, to push it aside, to hide from it, to not experience it. Make sense? And as a matter of fact, one of the things about this, of course, Julie and I were talking about this morning in the Abraham Hicks works, that our feelings are really some of the most, it is our guidance system. It's the way that we are actually recognizing when we are in alignment with our source and when we're not. And so by acknowledging those, we actually are using those as a way of getting the message of how we are in alignment with source and how we're out of alignment with source. Okay, so the third step. You guys ready for number three? Boy, we're just rolling through this. <laughs> number three, collapsing the story. Collapsing the story is completing this step represents the end of the line as far as traditional forgiveness goes. We ask the judging self to give way to the self-loving self. We talked earlier about we have these different selves inside. One of them is a judging self. We all seem to recognize that one. There's a part of us that's actually very judgmental of ourselves and everybody else as well for that matter. But, <laughs> but we're really good at doing it for ourselves, aren't we? And so it's really getting the self-judging self to step aside for a moment and allow the self-loving self. And we know that we have that part of ourselves as well. A part of ourselves that really does have compassion for our being. And so we ask that part of ourselves, we give that permission, and, and here's how that goes. Yes, we, let's take, for example, we need to bring some heart-centered energy to a particular situation where we have felt, well, we've been beating up on ourselves is probably the best way to say it. We've not been forgiving of ourselves. We've been holding a grudge against us. We've been holding ourselves in an experience of guilt and shame. And so here's, uh, we need to bring some heart-centered energy into this, and so here's how that goes. Yes, but have some compassion for me and try to understand why I did what I did. Yes, I am a flawed human being. I did something wrong. But if those who are judging me could imagine what it might have been like for, th for them had they been walking in my shoes like uh, uh, at that time under the same conditions and with all the emotional baggage I was carrying, then they might not be so judgmental of me. And so Mr. Judging Self and all those others out there who are criticizing me, 
do cut me some slack, please. <laughs> and if you cannot, at least try to imagine me as I once was when I was a tiny baby, innocent, unspoiled, whole, loving, trusting of those around me, a beautiful child of God. And so part of this step is really tapping into that part of ourselves that actually does have compassion for us. There's a part of us that, that really does try to do that. One of the things he says, it's, uh, and let me back up just a little bit. I want to back up a little bit back to the feelings. One of the things he, he talks about in working with the feelings is um, not to label them as being negative, uh, because they really are just energy and that they are there to really give us something that we, we want and need. And one of the things we want to avoid when we're working with feelings is to not jump into what he calls a spiritual bypass. You know what I'm talking about? A spiritual bypass? Another way to resist feelings is to engage in constructing a spiritual bypass. Many people, especially those who think of themselves as spiritual, think that feelings are to be meditated away rather than felt. It's important to acknowledge that many people in helping professions also bypass, anybody know that one? Uh, addicted uh, uh, to helping others is a way of avoiding their own feelings and emotional pain. Guilty. Yeah. So one of the things that sometimes we do is, rather than feeling our own emotional pain, we go help others with theirs, right? Because <laughs> it's so much easier for me to fix you than it is to fix me. <laughs> it's, it's fun, too, don't we? <laughs> no, I mean, isn't it? Just think about it. We get into our helping mode. And even if we're not professionals at that, unity people are helping people, aren't we? We have a tendency to move into that role. So it's important for us to recognize that. Let me back up over there. Okay, so I, we got that, and then we, were, we did the um, collapsing the story. He goes on to say, bringing compassion and empathy in a, to a situation that needs forgiveness also has the effect of reducing the intensity of the other feelings that we have um, about the crime that we have committed, uh, and whatever that might be. It won't do much, however, about the guilt, though since this process is directly related to what we did rather than how we interpreted it. And so uh, he talks about the difference between appropriate and inappropriate guilt. And there's a value in recognizing a difference between appropriate and inappropriate guilt. Appropriate guilt would be basically, I see someone on the road and I decide to run them over. I should feel guilty about that. Inappropriate guilt is I'm driving down the road, someone steps in front of my vehicle and I don't see them and I hit them and I harm them. I can feel remorse, I can feel regret, I can feel sadness, I can feel even just the, the, the sh shock and the horror of that. But is guilt actually the appropriate response? So that's one of the things that's valuable for us to pay attention to and notice. Is it really appropriate guilt or is it inappropriate guilt? And there's a value in recognizing the difference between the two. And then the fourth stage. This is where we actually get into the steps of what he would call the steps of radical forgiveness. The first three really are a part of any pretty much forgiveness process. Standard forgiveness as he recalls it. But the next step is where we really move into radical forgiveness. And this is the unique step in radical forgiveness, one that takes us beyond traditional forgiveness. And looking at and thinking about those worldviews that we were just looking at, those, those uh, uh, ways of looking at things, the paradigms, yes. So he says, um, we might say that the paradigm one represents prevailing worldview, while paradigm five represents a spiritual and metaphysical worldview. And this worldview would be more supportive of being in radical forgiveness. The powerful thing is you don't have to have that worldview for this process to work. You can still be in any of these paradigms. If you go through the process, it can still, still work. So one of the things about this is then you begin to rewrite this story, however, based upon a different paradigm, different worldview. 
you write, rewrite that experience from a different perspective. You see it in a different way. And here's a way you can adjust the paradigm. Let's say paradigm moving from paradigm one into paradigm the fifth one. I had made agreements with souls prior to my incarnation that I would do things not so much to other people, though it will feel that way while I'm in a body, but for them, while I'm here, others will enroll me to give them opportunities to learn. I will look like their enemy, but they will, see, they will come to see me as their healing angels. Interesting, huh? So part of the work of shifting is to reframe it from an awareness of or a thought about and to move it into an awareness of the possibility that there was a sole purpose for that experience. Now, whether it be something that you're doing for yourself or to your, with or to yourself or with or to another, you can actually begin to make that shift and look at the possibilities that there was something higher at work in that experience. And that's what reframing the story can be about. Reframing the story can also be about, and I'm, one of the most wonderful reframes that I have come across is in, in Ed Wein's book on, um, uh, uh, what's the name of the book again? Thank you. Uh, four Steps to, uh, Four Laws of Prosperity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the four principles of prosperity. I, I'm, I'm not giving the exact title right now, but that's the one I'm talking about, you guys. Uh, but she talks about this understanding how she had been really telling her story over and over again of being a victim all her life and all of the victim stories that she was sharing. And she had a very loving person tell her, cut it out. <laughs> in a very abrupt and very, you know, in her experience, a very rude and very inappropriate way. And what she gained from that was he went on to say, what if that was there for you to be able to become the kind of strong person that you are today? That's the story you want to be telling. That's the story that you want to hold on to. That there was a purpose for that so that you could experience the possibilities of a greater strength coming in and through you. That's the story you want to hold on to. And that's the process of moving into this step, next step. And then the fifth step in this process is then to integrate that shift, to recognize and recreate the new story of what the possibilities are from that experience, what the good and gift can be out of that experience, and then to begin to integrate that into your, your, your being. And one of the ways that he says do that is some physical activity, and, and it almost always involves your voice in some way by stating this story in a new way, either writing it out, he encourages doing breath work. I, the work that I really like to do is the EFT work, the tapping work that really does bring it into a physical being, into a physical connection, and begin to shift that energy into, in, in, a, in a real physical way. Way. So those are the five steps of radical self-forgiveness. So I'm going to ask you to take some time to reflect on and meditate on these steps this week on different scenarios and different experiences that you may have that you would like to have some experience of release from, whatever that might be. You get, you've got a couple, don't you? Oh, okay. I just want to check. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm talking to the right audience, you know? So, so have some time to, to, to play with those this week. Take some time to reflect on them, meditate on them. Next Sunday, we're going to go through a worksheet to go through these experiences with different experiences that you've had in life. And we're going to do some of this releasing work next week. So be sure and be here next week. And we're going to do some really good healing and clearing work on radical forgiveness. And that's our lesson for the week. All right. God bless you. Let's move into our meditation time, and we're gonna have, let's do a song. We'll do a song during meditation or or beforehand. Um, whatever you like. Oh, okay. <laughs>
why don't we go ahead and do it during meditation? Will you play some music for us? Okay. Sounds good. Oh, that's great. Yes. <laughs> so go ahead and get into a comfortable space. Take a nice deep breath. Begin to relax. And just allow the breath to flow in and out. And as you allow the breath to flow gently in and out, begin to be open to knowing and feeling and experiencing a connection, a connection with our whole being. connection with that part of our awareness and our consciousness that is totally immersed in the world, seeing ourselves as separate, limited, controlled by situations and circumstances, and just acknowledge that that's there. We all have that is a part of our awareness. And then we, of course, judge ourselves for having that and notice and pay attention to that part of ourselves, that voice inside. And then be open and willing to listen to another part of ourselves, a part of ourselves that sees that there's something greater at work in our lives, our experiences. Beginning to allow your awareness to rise. Begin to imagine and see yourself from the perspective of your loving, compassionate self. Begin to have compassion for where you are and the experiences you've had in life and all that's led up to you making decisions the way you make decisions and the way you are seeing and experiencing life and yourself, whether they be loving or judgmental. Just let yourself have compassion for even the judgmental self. And begin to allow yourself to move into an energy and a, a thought of recognizing that you are spirit. And that all of your life is about helping you to discover even more of yourself as a spiritual being. Feel what that feels like to see all of the experiences of your life from a higher perspective. And be willing to go another step and just simply know yourself as the one. And see yourself 
from that place. See and feel and hear the knowing, this is my beloved child in whom I am, in whom I am well pleased. Feel the absolute unlimited love and allow that love to pour through you. In the silence, in the silence. Take a nice deep breath now. Feel the heart with the energy of joy and gratitude, appreciation, and wonder at the amazing possibilities of good and healing and release. Take another nice deep breath. When you're open, gently open. When you're ready, gently open your eyes. Be present here and now.